lecture 11 of environmental science and we're going to be covering uh, chapter 15 today and looking at waste and basically what do we do with our waste and there's various types of waste that we're going to see that um, we produce as a society. So our outline is going to be basically um, what is waste, what happens when waste is dumped, how do we manage it, What's the role of recycle and reuse? And basically, how does our culture affect the consumption and ultimately the, how we produce waste and how we tolerate the waste and what we can do to reduce our wastes? So when we look at uh, the types of waste that we produce and what's the characteristic of this waste, probably uh, the thing that has brought human waste to the forefront today, because there's been periods of time when our own waste is kind of washed up on beaches and ended up you know, with no place to put it. So it, when we look at today, um, and actually this started in the late 90s, early 2000s, was the whole idea of um, a buildup of plastic pollution and what we call the Great car, uh, Garbage Patch, which was a basically an area of ocean um, between California and Hawaii that tended to have lots and lots of plastics. Now, not islands of plastics, but, and, and not, and the plastic itself wasn't called a gyre, but actually these were plastics that were circling in the oceanic dryer, uh, gyres, and we find these in other places. And when you go overseas, you'll see tons and tons of plastics just floating and suspended in water and also uh, deep in the water sometimes, settled in the benthic areas. So plastics have been our major concern. And this is just showing an example of some of the plastics that were, that were collected by uh, government entities and also military entities as they go along uh, sailing our oceans and sometimes in remote places. So when we look at waste, we have to pay attention to this concept called product life cycle. That means when an uh, industry makes a product, they look at the cost of making that product and materials that go into it. And today, thanks to hazardous waste laws, they have to look at reducing the amount of hazardous materials that go into it. And then they design it for the consumer use and and for shipping actually too. How do we get it to the consumer, whether the consumer is an, another industry or an actual person using a product or some agency using a product. So um, we then, they then have to look at what happens when, when that product is done with its use? Do we make it single use, multiple use? Is it meant to last a long time? Will this product become obsolete? And unfortunately, in our current product life cycle model, we don't pay attention to the waste component as much as we're supposed to, even though we do have federal laws, um, international recommendations by um, United Nations, and also sometimes state laws on manufacturing and waste reduction. So we're technically supposed to take a waste reduction uh, um, ideology or mentality when we look at what's called the downstream use. And we hear these terms called upstream and downstream, which is part of the waste stream in itself and how, or part of the product life cycle. But upstream just basically means what goes into planning and manufacturing that product and looking at how it be used, its safety and other things. Downstream actually means once you get it into the hands of the consumer and how do you get it there, and then what happens to it when the consumer is done with it. So uh, product life cycle is a very important concept and businesses spend a lot of time looking at this and researching it and then having a look at how do we become responsible to society in de developing a waste stream in particular with product life cycle that reduces uh, materials use and also allows for the reuse or maybe recycling or, or uh, minimal disposal of that product. So there's many ways that we classify waste and, and think about your own individual way of classifying waste. I mean, like when I buy a car, that car better last about 10 years. I'm serious. That's about the average lifespan of a car unless somebody takes me out on the road, you know, I mean, in an accident or the car just is crappy and breaks down, you know. So um, some people I know buy a car every two years and that means they have to get rid of the, the what they consider a clunker that they're owned before. And that could be, you know, they give it to it, you know, their kids or they sell it and put it on the used market. Or in some cases, they just trash it, sell it for scrap, depending on the condition of the car. So one of our major ways that we as consumers have the greatest impact over 
is something called municipal solid waste. And this just means your actual trash that usually comes from city type sources. That means buildings, houses, small commercial enterprises like retail shops and things like that. So this is probably the biggest of the producers that we deal with and the biggest producers daily in particular. And, and when we look at the per capita production of this type of waste, us as individuals produce a lot of stuff and we uh, I mean junk waste and when we look at municipal waste in different countries um, and this varies from year to year you know and with regulations in those countries because a lot of countries are running out of places where to put this waste because it just gets dumped in landfills basically like what's behind me so we see that um, Denmark and the United States are really big producers not only Denmark I mean I, I been there and never noticed them to be very wasteful except they just have a lot of intense city per unit of country and we tend to see that people in urban areas just by nature the urban area and the way we use things we produce a lot of waste and then you get down to um asia eastern europe you know uh, hungary somewhere down here or my dad's home countries down here they produce very little waste mostly because they use very little and they're good at minimizing uh, material use in general and a lot of it is due to the fact that they're just resource poor or they they don't have any place to put their resources and they just have a natural tendency to conserve materials so think of your solid waste as trash and also think of solid waste as what happens when a society tears down a building tears apart a highway to rebuild where does all that stuff go so solid waste is a very broad category and if you ever want to have fun Look at some of the government waste sites on solid waste. And I mean, not just from our country, but, you know, other countries and also look at state regulations on this or definitions, because sometimes states have their own definition if they're depositing a solid waste within the state. OK, which is very common. Sometimes we do discard to other countries or to other states. But um, it is amazing how we classify these things depending on the usage and depending on the chemical composition or actually physical competition means liquid or solid of that waste. And what's really probably the worst of all the solid waste is when we start getting into e-waste, electronic waste. Everything from smart watches to computers to cell phones because they contain microchips which are typically you know, very made out of very deadly materials and also very scarce materials that we should be reusing and recycling. So as we move on in time, we've seen from the 80s to the um, 2020s and beyond, the amount of waste uh, um, that we are producing is going up. Okay, now not as much as population growth, funny enough, which is kind of funny, but still as our, so, we're, we're producing about the same waste per person, but as our population goes up, we're seeing more waste generation. So waste is directly proportionate to population, but also it's proportionate to the environmental footprint that we make with product life cycle. How do we make products and how do people behave when a product is made? I mean, do we, do we naturally have a tendency of disposing it? Uh, do we buy a lot of that product? Because sometimes when things are cheap and efficient, we tend to buy more, that's Javon's principle. So you make cell phones cheaper, and it's not that it makes life cheaper, we just buy more and we live at capacity. And that then adds to our, what's called per capita generation of waste. So I mentioned product life cycle assessments, and any of you that are going into business management, business in general, particularly looking at, looking, you know, going into manufacturing jobs, think about this whole life cycle or product life cycle idea. So when we look at product life cycle means if I'm going to make something like a bottle of water, I have to research, you know, basically what's the cheapest way to make it to get the quality I want and, and what are people going to buy? How am I going to market this and what's going to happen to all of that product? Now, obviously with bottle of water, you're going to pee it out. You know, I mean, some people spill it out, whatever. But the problem is, is the bottle itself and shipping that bottle and the materials are going to shipping it. So we got to think about where's that bottle going to go. Now on our campus, we have refilling stations that you can refill a bottle and use it to the point where it disintegrates. Or you could just buy a regular bottle and fill from, you know, a water fountain or from spring water that you may have at home or something, you know, in a larger container. 
So when we, you know, so we have to think about where is this going to go? And many companies, unfortunately, don't think enough about particularly plastic bottles and how they end up the fact that they're going to be disposed. And unfortunately, you also got to look at human habit. Are people going to throw this just on the ground? I mean, think about this. I find this all the time. Uh, bottles literally in our yard and bottles in a property that we have that's not developed yet. We just find bottles from people that just drive by. Is it going to end up in a landfill? Are people going to recycle this like they're supposed to do? So we have to think about this in product life cycle. We have to look at the uh, downstream use, particularly human behavior. And are people going to naturally throw this out? Do people have a mindset of recycling? So all of this takes assessment and understanding human behavior. And at one time, our class, we actually had students and myself, we were hired by um, an agency to look at recycling in corporations that had recycling programs, particularly in uh, uh, downtown offices in Houston. And we would go down literally at after about nine o'clock at night to these closed office buildings. We had access to, to get in, so a security guard let us in. And, and the maintenance people that worked at night brought us all the trash from the agencies that were looking at their recycling habits. And we would spend that time till midnight just going through this stuff, collecting it, taking pictures and all sorts of things. And we found out that the recycling compliance varied from office to office. The worst people we found were geo, uh, geological companies, I mean, like petrol companies, and also uh, lawyers were the worst at recycling and not and putting garbage in the recycling bins and recycle stuff in the garbage bins. There was and, and regular business offices, you know, whatever, small businesses, they did a pretty good job. So we have to look at human behavior too. So just because something's recyclable or meant to be recycled doesn't mean people are going to do that. And this all goes under life cycle assessment. So when we do dump something, where does it go? I mean, this is kind of important to understand. And it goes into what we call landfills or dumps. And this is universal. And this goes back to ancient human history where we just threw out our trash in pits, usually away from where we were living because the trash would attract animals. That's how we got in association with dogs because wolves at the time, which is the ancestor of our modern dog, would come by and sniff our food remains and other junk that we left behind, including bodies probably of people that died. So we've learned to always dump stuff close enough to where we live that it's doable to walk it there, but also far enough that it wouldn't attract animals. And unfortunately, in poorer communities, people tended to live nearer to where the dump sites were. And dump sites became also collection points for humans to reuse and recycle trash. And the times I spent overseas, particularly it's uh, uh, funny enough in Manila, which I believe this is a picture of, um, is that kids, particularly when they were not in school or if they were not going to school at all, in many cases, they would be picking through the trash to reuse stuff, recycle, and I hate to tell you this, sometimes they pick bottles, water bottles out of the trash and just fill it with water and then sell it along the highways and unsuspecting tourists would buy that stuff. Sometimes they'd even sell it in tourist areas and the police would have to chase the kids away. And the way you would tell this type of water is the cat was loose when you bought it. And I wouldn't drink it, to be honest with you, because the bottles were probably just cleaned and not particularly washed. And who knows where the water came from. And this is typical for a lot of countries. I've seen it in, in Central and South America, too. So it's not just one particular country doing this. But so, guys, you know, these pits of waste tend to just sit there. And the material in them just builds up, builds up, and it can take hundreds of years for this stuff to decay, particularly when you pull it in a landfill. So when we start producing solid waste, we really don't have good ways of getting rid of it. Some people dump it in water, some, you know, oceanic or in lakes or in rivers. Farmers usually just dump it in big piles and cover it up with backfill or would dump it in ravines. Today, we dump them in formalized landfills because we don't want this stuff getting out into nature. And particularly sometimes what decomposition does go on and chemicals that are in these disposed plastics can leak out into the environment into our water table that people get drinking water from.
Landfills are also notorious for producing gases, particularly from foods and paper products that rot. And again, things rot slowly, so it produces methane or methane, produces a lot of carbon dioxide and other and sulfur oxides, which we know are all greenhouse gases, plus methane is flammable, or methane is flammable. And this becomes a problem. These things could explode, that literally the kids that are walking through here can literally asphyxiate, okay, or undergo what's called anoxic or low oxygen conditions, and that could be deadly. There are also toxic fumes that come out from people that dispose of hazardous chemicals, and sometimes household chemicals that are not classified as hazardous, but can harm you. So these things all get out. Think about that, particularly in landfills like this, which are basically, you know, exposed pits. So landfills don't only produce air pollution. They could also produce water pollution. So the soil that a landfill sits over, if it is not provided with a barrier to hold on to water and a way to funnel the water away and collect it, that stuff will leak into the soil and it will leak as what's called a plume, a plume, P-L-U-M-B, and that will travel in groundwater. Now guys, this is not a body of water, this is soil containing water, but it will flow in the groundwater and sometimes that plume will get right down to the bottom of the soil, to the bedrock, and travel along there, and sometimes even leak into aquifers, and that then becomes a big problem because uh, the aquifers would filter it, but it does clog up the aquifers. So, if, and you have to pay attention to the flow of the plume too. So, if you're living in a house right here near a landfill, which is very typical in many areas, and and if you're getting groundwater as you know through a well, you're in damn trouble. So, we have to pay attention to this when we look at landfill design. And this is why just dumping garbage on the soil is a bad idea without treating the soil in a way or producing a formal pit to put this place. Again, ocean dumping is not very unusual. Unfortunately, this is used sometimes in maritime operations. A lot of ships used to do this. And I know I was on a research ship and on a couple of large ships, and that's where our sewage went, but we did pre-treat it a little, but sometimes it wasn't. I mean, guys, in the old days of shipping, people just pooped in an opening and it went into the water, and that was it. And any litter went into, uh, the, they just dumped it in the ocean, assumed it would go away. And this is how we even used to handle hazardous chemicals. We dumped the hazardous chemicals down a drain, and it would hopefully dilute to the point where the toxicity was so low it wasn't a problem and so you get a lot of it being dumped. So ocean dumping was very common and that included dumping of barrels containing waste, radioactive materials, hazardous materials, you name it. I mean, you can go down the list on the slide and these things ended up biomagnifying and bioaccumulating. That means bioaccumulating, I mean, is building, uh, it would end up accumulating the bodies of animals and then transfer through the fruit chain to biomagnify into other creatures and then ultimately humans might eat that creature. And we've seen animals so polluted with ocean toxins that um, another animal would eat a polluted animal and die from acute toxicity, which is horrible when you think about it. Uh, luckily, we don't do this much today due to international recommendations. One thing that was also done a lot uh, particularly in the 70s when we had a boom of plastic pollution and a boom of consumer product pollution that we had nothing to do with, we learned that you can sell that stuff and you can trade it. And actually, I believe in this. I believe in a hazardous waste trade and a waste trade. And I actually wrote a document once for a group called the Houston Advanced Research Council in a, in a project called Houston Foresight, where I said we should have zero waste. And either we don't produce waste particularly hazardous waste. I wrote the hazardous waste document with a group of people. I said, if there's a way to market it and people would buy it, that's great. And we do. We've had a waste trade for a long period of time. And I think that's important to know. And I was hoping that Houston and Texas can capitalize it to make sure that nothing goes in the landfill or hazardous waste dump. But what would happen is this waste would be uh, bought by somebody, put on barges, or shipped to areas hoping that somebody would buy it, and it ended up a mess. And some places would be dumped. I mean, the waste would end up just dumped in a country 
with nobody to buy it. We just assume, or you know, someone went to buy it, went broke or whatever, or was buying it as a tax write-off in another country. We don't know what the hell was going on. But anyway, um, so there is abuse to this, but it is a very important thing. But we've had a history of abuse where waste is shipped and sometimes has nowhere to go. And there was a case of a barge in New York City that the waste was put up for sale. The purchaser went uh, 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 refused to buy the stuff when it got to the destination. And his poor barge just sat around for a long time with no place to put the waste. And sometimes what happens is other countries will be doing this and they just dump the waste off the barge because they got to get it back to put it into commission for whatever job it was doing. And this forced um, um, you know, the United Nations to come up with a policy that we can't be doing this and that we have to be honest about waste, particularly e-waste. And a lot of times, guys, your e-waste gets recycled, but you got to think about it becomes part of the waste trade. And most of our e-waste ends up in um, mostly Africa, but in parts of Asia, okay, where it ends up in an area like this and kids pick through it by hand. And what's even worse about it is the kids will pick through it first, get the valuable plastics out that they can pick out, and then they set this stuff on fire, melt the plastic away, and they extract and pull apart the melted metals that they get most of that money for. And this is dangerous to them. These kids die sometimes from the toxins produced by burning this stuff and handling stuff. They can die at, you know, 20 something years old from doing this for a living. And they have to sometimes because they have no choice and it's profitable because this stuff then gets bought back to the United States or other countries that manufacture electronics at a very low cost. They buy it. Okay, and it comes back to you to then go back to this dangerous waste trade market. So the waste trade market in itself is not evil, but it leads to a type of corruption that exploits countries in particular that have high human labor, low wages, and, 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 and people are desperate to find work and also to find resources themselves. Now, when we think about when we dispose of waste too, most of us living in this area, unless you live in parts of Humble or around Dayton, you know, or parts north of here, you'll see waste dumps right close to housing. You can see that around the Copperfield area too. But um, usually what we run into is most landfills or waste sites end up in poor neighborhoods. And a lot of that is not, you know, the fact that we build them in poor neighborhoods is when the neighborhood was really developed or the landfill was developed. Yeah, that neighborhood now has a lower property value and tends to attract lower income communities and multi, you know, person housing, like, you know, apartments and projects. Now, sometimes, yes, we do have to build new landfills. And again, that's where we intentionally put it in lower income areas because you don't want a company doesn't want to invest in, you know, per acre footage of land that's not going to really make them money. So they want the cheap land. So this is an unintentional discrimination, but still in itself, there is intent. And a lot of times we just don't worry about the consequences of it. And this makes communities sick and also angry. And we see this a lot. Uh, uh, landfills that are in upper income areas tend to be much better designed and much well, uh, well managed than those in lower income areas. And we find that, again, people have to, you know, form community groups to deal with this social justice or in what we call environmental justice. So the people that don't produce the waste as much we see, especially in other countries where we do send waste sometimes, we have to pay for waste to be disposed. The people that don't produce the waste get the bulk of the waste. Those that produce the waste don't suffer the benefits of making it. And we have to correct that. That's a big injustice that we have to deal with. And it's a very uncomfortable thing because many of you don't want to live near your own waste. And some of you are forced to live near other people's wastes. So how do we manage our solid waste? Where does our waste go? Again, uh, it goes under modern waste management systems. And we do have many laws, state laws, sometimes uh, city laws federal laws that set standards, all for looking at um, different types of disposal. So we have sanitary landfills, which means stuff that just has regular household stuff, 
that is usually not recyclable, not hazardous. We have geological disposal, like for mining materials, stuff like that. And 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 we can um and then we have containment buildings where we can store stuff too. So there's different types of places we can put things. We can recycle them back into the ground, or we can inject it into the ground. We can put it in a landfill, which is kind of in the ground, but you know, it's 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 basically just this big open area that we cover up. Okay, or we can or we can put them in containment sites like we learn with nuclear waste sometimes so we can isolate the waste that means get it away from people not all people at least get it away to the point where you're not living it and seeing it we can incinerate or we convert that waste to something else we can use it for energy production which incineration doesn't always do we could um, make it into another material you know whatever i mean there are certain hazardous waste that we can convert literally into vitamins i'm serious about that Zinc, uh, 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 chromium, other things that are highly toxic can be converted, but the problem is there has to be a market for it. It has to be done cost effective. So when we look at waste disposal, guys, one of the biggest issues in waste disposal is money. It, and that's it. No matter what country you go to, you got to save dollars, euros, liras, pesos, whatever. And you got to do it in the most efficient manner too. We can't be dumping waste far away. It has to be convenient. So this is what goes into decision making when we look at how we dump waste, where we dump waste. And I know when I was in um, actually interviewing for a job in Key West, I discovered that their waste has to be incinerated. They have no place to put it. They have no landfills on any of the key islands that would take it, and it would take literally an hour and a half drive to two hour drive to get waste to uh, Key Largo or Miami to dump it, which added to the cost and also the the, the, the um, potential for that waste when it's on a truck to fall off and end up all over the Keys or in the Atlantic Ocean. So there are a lot of decisions that go into it. And this is one of the biggest issues we have in our society today is what do we do with our garbage? So you will see a a, a, a video about landfills and how they work but another way we can dump waste is by incineration and I mentioned this just like was done in Key West or is done in Key West Texas uh, Houston actually has a couple of incinerators and we're looking at building more because we're at a landfill place and not and no communities are volunteering to say hey let's build a landfill and you can't put them out in rural areas because it takes too much gas and, and time to get it out there. It's too expensive to put it on a truck and ship it far. There's a certain uh, cost benefit of removing waste based on distance and also land values. So when we incinerate waste, we use combustion and there's several types of combustion. We could use coal to do it, gasoline, natural gas, which means you're burning fossil fuels. And then, or we could use plasma, which uses electricity to form the plasma. And that tends to be a little more efficient at times, but you still, to produce electricity, you have to have a power plant somewhere producing electricity. But basically by combustion, you burn the stuff. Most of it turns to gas, depending on the nature of the waste. That gas is collected. You can actually collect it. Most of it is not vented off except to carbon dioxide and water but you can collect the gases, liquefy it, or solidify it, whatever you want to do. You, can, you also produce ash from the burning and this stuff gets hauled out and you reduce the waste like 10,000 fold to almost a million fold, depending on what you're burning. And this does reduce solid waste because now you can t take a 10, you know, a thousand times more time than to fill a landfill with this or you can actually recycle this material, reuse it as what we call carbon black, which goes into car tires and sometimes plastics. So there are things you can do with incineration waste. But the thing is, it does require energy and it does produce toxic materials sometimes that have to be disposed of if we can't reuse it somehow. So that's incineration. Uh, we mentioned landfills. So isolation again is just the use of landfill and we have sanitary landfills, which are also called municipal landfills. And these are the ones that we see around here. They're the most obvious. If you ever want to see a bunch of old ones, drive up 
to Dallas and on Highway um, uh, um, 45, you'll see a, a, a bunch of these along the side of the road. They kind of look like mountains. It's really kind of cool. And sometimes we build on these, depending on if it's a flat one or if you have a, a hump type. But basically, this is a ditch that has a liner to prevent stuff from getting out. That means these are not just a ditch. We they're very specially built, and you'll see that in a video. And they and these things are, are managed. It's not just filled and abandoned. I mean, I see some of those when I was a prof in Oklahoma, but most of these are very structured and they follow federal guidelines on what to put in there and how to take care of it. So these are very specific structures, but the problem is they take up a lot of land. When they are filled, you can repurpose the land. We've built schools on these lands. We can put a, a manufacturing on these lands. You can turn the lands into a park, a ski slope, except here that wouldn't work too well unless you put fake snow and uh, other things you can do with this. So there are various things you can do with the land when you're done with it. But still, these things can, once that junk is in there, it takes hundreds of years to thousands of years to decay. So here we have geologic isolation. That just means you put stuff underground like Yucca Mountain you've learned about. We could also, um, for geological disposal, we can take stuff like mining waste and repurpose the mine by putting it back into the ground or using it as fill of some type. <clears throat> you know, we can fill up old uh, uh, wells and stuff like that and mines that, that can collapse. So this does have a good positive purpose as long as the material is not, not hazardous. But um, we do use sometimes old mines to put junk because you hide it away. It is isolated and sometimes liquid waste can be injected into old oil wells because these are pretty much, you know, impermeable things, not always, you know, but still. So this is another form of containment and we do use this in Texas. Now, of course, the um, whole idea of isolating and burning and doing whatever is it has its challenges. And a lot of these challenges have to do with you know, the waste remaining for a long period of time or in the process of, you know, getting rid of the waste, we can contaminate the environment or we could contribute to fossil fuel uses. So just think about this, about think about every product you use. Think about the product life cycle, particularly think about your role in the product life cycle. And what does this material take to get rid of? What's its ability to be reused? What happens when it gets into the ground? I mean, you can actually take a bottle and study its breakdown and you might find out that you might not live long enough to continue to study because the product, when it's used, might last longer than you. And it might even last longer than your body when it's rotting in the ground. Okay, so think about this and think about the ease of recycling that product or repurposing it for something else. I know there's groups of art artists I know and, 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 and architects that specialize in reusing and repurposing materials to take them out of this waste stream and to reduce some of the challenges of disposing our wastes. So again, there are various strategies that we can look at to reduce the waste stream, which the best way is just don't produce the waste, but that's not gonna happen for a long period of time. So we can look at conversion again which is sort of a way of recycling or reusing in a way we convert it to something else, either energy or another product. Uh, um, and, and this is true particularly for waste to energy facilities. And sometimes we can collect the outcomes of a landfill. That means we can collect the nasty gases and other things that come out. And particularly we can use the methane for purposes. And, and I know in New York City, we had this large landfill right on the, uh, uh, Atlantic Ocean called, um, oh darn it, I knew I forget. Okay, Starrett City Landfill in, in an area called Starrett City. Okay, uh, um, in, in, uh, Brooklyn, in Brooklyn and Queens. And it was a huge landfill. It was called the Mountain of uh, New York, I mean of Brooklyn. And um, this landfill gave off a lot of methane that was a problem for the community. It also gave off a lot of odors. So the, uh, the, the residents petitioned the city to 
you know, get rid of the landfill or do something to it, cover it up. And you can't just put a tarp on it. I mean, because the gas has built up. So what happened was some people got together with some uh, grant money and they put a covering on it, collected the gases coming off and were able to use the methane to reduce the cost of heating a housing project that was in the area and some apartments and other areas. And this helped the community actually, not only getting rid of the stink and the dangerous methane gas and other gases coming off, but it was converted to fuel to heat, to help lower income people. So there are things we can do. It's just that, again, you have to make it cost effective and worthwhile for people to do it. And it has to be easy to do too. Some of the newest technologies, and I've actually done some work with this, some projects with this and training on this, is we can use what are called bioreactors and landfill bioreactors. That means we can take the trash and add certain things to it called enzymes or specific microorganisms. And those microorganisms can turn this into alcohol, into other products, into glycerol. Um, we, we were able to take food waste and turn it into various things. I mean, it was amazing what we can do. And we could even take certain chemicals and just disintegrate stuff into harmless chemicals, sometimes into animal feed. And this is sometimes called remediation. We could also take waste and, and let plants and other and microorganisms take up the materials, concentrate it, and then mine the plants. It means actually take the plants or organisms, grind them up, extract the material which normally went up in the landfill and we and we don't don't have to mine it anymore we've been able to take uh metals out of water ocean water and concentrate it very much like what you would find in a mine into little pellets so there's a lot of technologies out there thing is we got to make it cost effective for us so people what we really need to do is you know get away from reducing waste and the two probably least practical but best ways to do it is just not to produce the waste itself that means just be less of a consumer okay or just make materials that have lower input and are simpler i mean you go to other many developing countries they don't have a lot of the large ornate things and uh, uh even like computers that we have here. I mean, things are a little more simpler and made with less materials. But but we do have the option of not throwing stuff out if we could also focus the product life cycle on recycling and reuse. And reuse is probably the um, most environmentally friendly way, but the most difficult way to prevent waste. Recycling, you know, is probably the most effective way to do it, but it does produce waste in itself. Like when we recycle paper on campus, it does pollute to recycle the paper and we have to put energy into it. And when we recycle plastics, you have to melt them down and have facilities that, you know, collect it, clean it, and that again, produce waste in itself. So these options are not always perfect and they in themselves can produce waste, particularly hazardous waste. Now our job is as a society is you just make things that are in the product life cycle that are meant to be recycled or meant to be reused and this used to be an old way that we did things at one time like with glass bottles is as a kid you know i made money for, for myself because you know i worked for family business and that money that time you know the time i put into that that money went to the family but and any other thing other things i did the money went to the family but for myself i would collect glass bottles and metal bottles and return them and those glass bottles were just washed and reused. I mean, literally just reused, particularly drink bottles and also jars if they weren't cracked or, you know, particularly just have to be resealed. The metal obviously became either reused, like the metal was actually slashed open and flattened and turned into something else. I remember having toys as a kid, cheap toys, like a metal car, a little toy car made out of metal and once the body fell off the chassis of one of the cars and basically inside the car I could see a label from Coca-Cola. It was funny because they just took a Coke bottle, flattened it, put it into a press and turned it into a little cheap toy car.
you know, I mean, and, and that, that was particularly true from toys we got from Europe and toys that came in from Japan. It was really, I mean, we, you didn't see that too much in the United States, but in those countries, reuse was very important, much more than at that time in the United States. So these are doable things, but understand that products have to be developed for this purpose, for this outcome, and that there are, you know, certain products that are better than others and certain percentages that we do. And we're just really right now not in a really powerful recycle reuse mode in our society because very little of the materials we produce do make it, you know, do not make it into the recycle and reuse stream. So when we think about recycling as a society, we got to think about, you know, what are we recycling in the first place? Because you can't just say I'm going to recycle. Each product's different and we have to gear up to meet that, you know, what's out there. So we're going to see that, and this is a California study, but a lot of other studies show this too, is that uh, plastic waste is, and paper waste are the two biggest things. And particularly when we look at today with the, the, the preponderance of um, plastic materials going into cars and other things, and also the, th the fact that now we're living in a society that everything is shipped to us. Or, or in big box stores, is these things have to be packaged. So the whole idea that we manufacture things from great distances and sometimes have to have stuff Amazon to our house, this increased packaging since the beginning of Amazon and Alibaba and all these other groups that, that now can individually ship consumer products, the amount of waste has gone up tenfold as far as packaging waste. And also plastics that go into manufacturing shippable materials because you have to make a product to be shipped when you're shipping them it's not the same as shipping stuff to a big box store or a grocery store or department store is that has some that goes into special packaging so that the consumer when they handle that product or the shipping company gets it that product is protected so we've seen lots of things that go along with recycling but we have to know what we're recycling and look at where to focus our efforts where the major waste stream is because a lot of people want to recycle food scraps and, and, and construction materials, but that's not as big a market and might be more difficult to do or to encourage someone to try to make a living doing that. Right now, making a living recycling is not very good, particularly in this country where labor is high and the cost of recycling materials is pretty cheap. To buy, I mean, it's pretty cheap to buy recycled material and it doesn't justify setting up an expensive operation to make very little money. And the thing we gotta think about too when, when we make products or when you buy a product is is that product gonna go into what's called the primary recycling stream or the secondary? Or what's sometimes called closed loop, open loop, lots of terminology here depending on who created the terms. So, you know, um, cause certain things you can recycle back into that material depending on how it's used. Other things when they make it into a product you might not be able to recycle them back into that product because they're mixed with something else. And it's particularly true for the materials that go into a car. When a car is recycled, guys, you have steel mixed with plastic and, and other materials and composite materials and fiberglass, and those are difficult to separate. And, 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 and sometimes impurities are added to that original product. With plastic bottles, it's not a problem. They can re be recycled directly and made into something. Plastic bags are the ultimate of not being able to recycle because you can't just melt down a plastic bag and turn it back into a plastic bag. You usually have to convert it into something else, either reuse it or they get melted down and turned into like park benches, which is more of a secondary type of recycling. So we've got to pay attention to this. When we look at recycling, it's not that easy. And it's difficult for me to sometimes promote recycling because particularly when we recycle overseas, when we ship stuff overseas to recycle, is it produces pollutants that we don't want in this country. So we give it to other countries to deal with because that also adds to the cost of recycling our country. So I think about who's this going to, who's being affected by this when recycling is occurring. So, you know, uh, read your book more about this because you can see in this chart here, of what products are more likely to be reusable, be primarily recycled, secondarily recycled, and whatever. But you know, there's lots of data out here about the effectiveness of, of it and the efficiency. But we also got to think about, guys, the hidden costs. 
the what we call sometimes the extrinsic costs of um, the pollution produced is this impacting certain people and you know the actual cost itself is this subsidized because a lot of places recycling is subsidized and I know in my neighborhood we have to pay for recycling either by paying a group a, a company to come in and pick up the stuff or I have to drive a good distance to a recycling center particularly for hazardous materials and for electronic waste so as this slide shows we do have to pay attention to the economics of it I mean this is it comes down to we live in a society where people want to live in the best capacity that they can and not be spending a, a lot of money on things that we technically don't see and that other people suffer the consequences of so like in some states there are certain things you just can't recycle because it's not either cost effective or it's just not safe to do sometimes the economics is not there or it could just be that that material is not used that much so when you look at the recycling label it doesn't mean that that thing has to be recycled it means there's a potential to it but it doesn't say much about anything else or whether it can be recycled effectively or economically in our country or not or in your state or not so over and over again you're going to hear from me you know basically there's advantages and there's limitations or bad outcomes to recycling but to be honest guys just because right now at this point in time there's limitations it doesn't mean that these are permanent limitations or that we're stuck with them we have to think about upfront the upstream the design of products we have to make them more reusable and more recyclable and and we do have recommendations on this there are standards produced by a group called ASTM there are there are federal guidelines guidelines by manufacturing companies but guys who determines that overall as a consumer and I hate to say this but a company could do their best job making recyclable things and reusable things or even biodegradable things that just break down to nothing but if people don't like them we don't pursue it so we end up with the pizza boxes from hell that last forever and these plastic little individualized things because sometimes we want stuff individually wrapped because it stays fresher and we're only going to use a little amount we don't want to store a large amount and even things like toothpaste rolls we make them we don't have to have toothpaste that way we can have toothpaste in a solid form I've used toothpaste that came out of little uh, um, cardboard like containers and toothpaste that it was actually in a recyclable jar why do we have to have it in a squeeze container that can't be recycled so there's all sorts of ways of doing things but we got to think upstream and but and, and and guys I've seen over my lifetime products that had wonderful upstream designs as far as for recyclability and reusability and people hated it and we particularly see this in the plastics market where we try to make plastics that are less toxic and more biodegradable but they're flimsy they're crackly they're uh, like particularly a bag of chips the traditional way of making a bag of chips when you open it up it doesn't make a lot of noise the, the plastic is kind of smooth but the newer biodegradable ones are crinkly noisy and sometimes if they get wet they start to disintegrate and also the, they're porous which means sometimes uh, uh, atmospheric gases can get in and and uh, moisture can get out of the product and it can spoil and dry up easily so we really have to rethink about up front how we make things but also we have to think about as a consumer we got to change our thinking on what we want out of products and guys and one thing we do have in our world in general is what are called cottage industry ways of doing things I mean small businesses people that make these set up these marginal companies mostly not so much to make a big profit but to help the earth so we could reuse refurbish repurpose recycle we can build houses out of trash and stuff like this I know in some of our student groups uh, like PTK and the eco club um, we would come up with contests and missions to do this type of thing so you know there's stuff that's out there that we can do but it's not always stuff that is systemic built into society and it's not big and global now it's a lot of developing countries you see great ideas 
but they just won't work here. Now one of the, you know, we're talking about solid waste. We also have liquid waste, chemical waste, sewage waste. I mean, we, we, now we can't upstream design, redesign people to not poop and pee. And we can't just say, well, eat less to make less. Is we, we have to think about how we repurpose it. We can repurpose poop into fertilizer. We can turn urine into fertilizer. I mean, there are things that we could do. It doesn't mean you go out into your backyard and you poop and pee in it. That's actually illegal in most areas because it is a contaminant and a hazardous material. But we can treat it in energy efficient ways. And, and we had a group of students uh, um, we took to the Philippines and they were looking at taking this human waste that would normally end up literally just <laughs> in the people's village. I mean, the stuff just flowed into the street and into a you know little stream. I wouldn't even call it a stream. It was just a little body of water that flowed when it, when it rained. But um, <clears throat> their waste, they were suffering from their own waste. And we were finding ways for them to treat their waste and turn it into cooking fuels and into fertilizer that was safe to use into something we call biosolids and methane gas. There are many ways if we don't get rid of plastic, we can grind up plastic and instead of shipping it to landfills and dumping it overseas for you know other people to manage in our own country, we can take these things and tear them apart and repurpose them again into things like benches. We can use them you know, from construction materials and this is being tested already. So there are things to do with plastic so we don't have to dump them or melt them down. There are many processes that we could even convert these to other materials or even we have organisms now that could eat plastic. There's an insect, some fungi and bacteria could actually eat the plastic and turn it into sugar and other materials. We could even turn plastic into, you know, like alcohols and things like that. So guys, so when we look at how we use products and how we produce waste, the, the major factor is culture is our attitudes and this goes back to the beginning of the class when we start talking about how we fit into the earth and how do we use the earth and 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 culture also includes economics so we have to pay attention to that too but how much we consume what we consider is material wealth are all important factors and our attitude about the environment once we're done with a product how long we use a product is very important and a lot of this has to do with socioeconomics too you know the more wealth we have the more likely we are to waste materials and want a lot of materials and want these giant you know stores that specialize in stuff we really don't need we have to look at reducing our wants and reducing our perception of what is a perfect and quality product. And that particularly is true of foods. So, so read about culture and consumption in your book, because it's really funny. The United States at one time acted like a developing country, and particularly during scarcity periods of World War I and World War II, we were desperate for resources and we made the best reuse of stuff. It was amazing. You know, uh, agricultural products were turned into like, you know, agricultural waste was turned into things like gelatin and, 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 and animal waste was turned into fuel. And um, I mean, using things that we think are advanced technologies today, people were doing back then during those wars, you know, Chicken feathers made their way into pillows, um, all sorts of stuff. Metal was uh, um, pressed into other things. So, I mean, we have the ability and we had the knowledge as a country and as a world when, when there were desperate times that many of us forgot about, that we were very good at upstream production of stuff that could be reused and recycled. And also we were very creative about reuse and recycling. We've kind of lost that as we became more wealthy and as scarcities were not as big a deal because we started increasing uh, our imports. So can we reduce our waste? Yes, we've done it before. Other places are doing it. We just got to rethink this, you know, so it is doable. But the thing is, guys, we as consumers have to request this. We request this by our buying patterns. We request this 
through communicating with companies. There's nothing wrong with writing a business and say, I don't like this because if enough of us do, or if enough of us don't shop at a place because we're not happy with those products or not happy with the recyclability of it, that's important. We have a voice and we can just basically, you know, do things that help with the upstream decisions. And yes, we do have government actions, but these are very subject to change. It could be easily struck down by a president. You know, we've I've seen that a couple of times in my, in my life. Okay, and um, you know, people also vote, and we can propose to our legislators that we want this. And if enough of us do that, not just special interest groups, but regular citizens. We will see more policies, but we have to understand as a citizen too, is we may pay for it. You go to Europe, you go to um, Asia, they have to pay directly for improving the environment and for reducing waste. And guys, there's also nothing wrong with using community initiatives. If the feds don't want to do it, we can do it on a local basis. It's very true, particularly for food waste. There are people that would collect food waste and turn it into something else. People are I know people, a guy that set up a dog poop collecting business in Austin because it's actually illegal to let your dog poop all over the place. And it is considered a hazardous waste and a major contaminant of drinking water. So you, we could, so there are people that can collect it, bag it, make it a safe type of fertilizer. Okay. And, and it's okay as long as it's safe. So there are what we call cottage industries, artists that turn waste into materials, you know, uh, um, small manufacturers that can take waste and turn it into a building material, into a material that goes into building a car. There's all sorts of things we can do at the grassroots level. And I know people that do this, particularly in the Austin area for some reason, but you know, they, they, they have these small companies that that take this way, sometimes they pay for it, sometimes they get it for free and find cost effective ways for them to, to, you know, to repurpose it and actually make a little profit on it. I do want to end with something kind of interesting because um, our waste, when we start dealing with many wastes, particularly municipal waste, sanitary waste, that stuff does not decay. And we thought it always did because we never really dug down into these waste pits, particularly the older ones. And as a matter of fact, University of Arizona, and why did they do it? Because they were very close to some really old budding cities that had landfills that were buried a long time ago and just kind of sat around. So the um, University of Arizona actually has a garbology program. I mean, there is a technical name for it. It's called, it's ar archaeology archeology related to you know, waste, but I mean, it's in the archaeological department because they're all studying human habits. Is that, you know, we uh, research studies generally out of University of Arizona, but other places have discovered that the waste does not go away. The uh, University of Arizona was notorious for going to Las Vegas to look at and characterize the waste that was used there as Las Vegas went from a simple little truck stop at one time, you know, gas station to a major condensed city with a lot going on, you know, they they looked at how people's habits have changed on, on waste disposal and also product usage. You could actually look at product usage, consumer things in there. But guys, they found like chicken bones that were not decayed and, and food waste that was not decayed for 20, 30, 40 years. Newspapers that were 40 years old and still intact. When things get into a landfill, it becomes anoxic real quickly. And it, and, it dry, and it becomes dry real quickly and it tends to preserve things and mummify them. That stuff could last forever. Now, and this is bad. So we have to even think about how do we do it? Thanks to them, we have to think about how do we redesign landfills so stuff does decay. It's bad for the garbologists, but it's great for us. But they contribute a lot of knowledge on how we even recycle because they've looked at landfills uh, old landfills and looked at when did recycling start and did that impact the composition of landfill. So there's all sorts of, you know, ways we can study our garbage even from the past and look at how good we are at throwing out waste and the, the volume of waste that goes in, but also 
what happens when that waste enters a landfill? Where does it go? And can we find ways to cause that garbage to decay so we can continually fill that landfill? So as a citizen in your own household, how could, you know, if you don't feel politically active, if you're not going to run a company that eventually you'll make into this green company, what could you do? And the main thing is to just reduce what you use. Keep track of your waste. Be better at reusing, recycling, or just not using at all. If you get an Amazon box, collect the boxes, ship it back to them. They'll pay for it. Find out you could even drop off boxes at other places, at moving centers where people would, there are drop off places. There are churches that will collect, you know, stuff from the house for people to repurpose. Old furniture, things like that. I've donated two cars to, um, you know, one to a woman's shelter and, and another to um, a family that was in need. You know, so I mean, there are things you can do to, to take action. But just your own habits of reducing, particularly food waste, you know, buy what you need. Don't, you know, you know, don't, don't buy a lot of prepackaged foods that, that contain a lot of waste material. So the consumer is in charge. We are actually making the decisions by our wants, really, mostly not by our needs as much, but by our wants. And I think this is very important because it's our perception of things that really impact how as a consumer we affect the product stream, what we interpret as quality.